Good evening and aloha from the woods of Maine. It is the 30th of November. Thanksgiving um, has come and gone. And uh, I thought it would be time to start recording again. The days are getting very short, very cold, and it actually snowed a little bit last night. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the night before. And it is a precursor of the things to come. In any case, uh, this is the Acadian orogeny. Um, this is really the guts of Maine, New Hampshire, Eastern Mass, Rhode Island, Eastern Connecticut, uh, and Rhode Island. Uh, at, you go west of this and you're getting into more the Taconic orogeny. And that was uh, several uh, tens of hundreds of millions of years. I mean, several tens of millions of years earlier. And this is really, you would categorize this as really the second part of the closing of the, I, of the Iapetus Ocean between uh, Gondwana and Laurentia. So the first step was the Taconic with uh, your Green Mountains in Vermont that go up through Quebec. Uh, they graze northwestern, top of northwestern Maine a little bit. Uh, they also um, are found over uh, throughout Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland, and into uh, England, and what have you. And those, uh, the, 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 over there, they're named the, uh, I believe, the Dalradian. Um, sequence or what have you but there are different names over there but anyways the taconic was a series of uh, uh an island arc that slammed into uh a arc near the laurentian um coastline and then uh accreted on to north america and then behind that uh was more uh, Iapetus Ocean, a much larger portion of it between uh, the subcontinent of uh, Avalonia on its way over uh, across the Iapetus and it made its way across the Iapetus and then it slammed into the Laurentian uh, margin in the New England area as well as the eastern uh, Canada and into the, uh, Western Europe. Um, there are pieces of this. Uh, the majority of this was uh, caused by two terrains. One is called the Ganderia terrain, and the other one is the Avalon uh, supercontinent. I mean, microcontinent. Uh, you can think of Ganderia as a series of um, oceanic arcs, uh, maybe even uh, raised um, oceanic uh, crust. In any case, it was a melange of arcs and oceanic crust that end up becoming a, you know, literally like an accordion as it got slammed into um, New England. So Ganderia, we look at it as it has both um, continent, uh, not continental fragments, but it has uh, intermediate volcanic like andesite, dacite, um, as well as mafic uh, lavas, obviously the ocean floors mixed in with it. And, and, and what it did is Ganderia was, it was essentially getting stretched um, as it was getting pulled across the Iapetus Ocean. And then once it got to North America, or Laurentia rather, uh, then it sort of just sort of slammed into it and then crunched. And maybe a good idea would to think of uh, the, the Ganderia train is probably three to five times longer or wider than what you see here in New England. Uh, in New England, you see the Ganderia train is probably about 100 miles across, but it was likely, you know, much, much wider, much, much more spread out, uh, much thinner uh, as far as crust goes um, when it was in its journey across the Iapetus. Uh, once it hit um, the island arcs and the uh, ocean uh, floor that was between the island arcs, more or less uh, just crumpled and rode up on top of each other and sandwiched themselves and shortened significantly to make up what we now call the uh, the, the, the uh, Merrimack Trough, the uh, Central Maine Trough, uh, what have you. Those are areas of both ocean sediments and um, 
Island Arcs, and that is Gandhari Train. Avalon, on the other hand, is a, uh, without a doubt, a piece of Northern Africa that is continental. It's much more felsic, much thicker, um, and it was rifted off of Northern Africa and dragged across uh, the Iapetus Ocean. And then behind that is the Raic Ocean, and then once that shut, uh, Gondwana uh, essentially um, came right to our shores and slammed into North uh, uh, um, Laurentia. Uh, one thing I might add is that the Gandaria terrain, uh, when being compared to the Avalon terrain, we believe that Gander Gandaria was actually rifted off of um, the northern part of Amazonia, which is part of South America. So in a sense, uh, as the on the other side of the Iapetus Ocean, when the, when the uh, rift zones opened up or the trenching or subduction began to take place, both those pieces ripped off of, Ga of Gondwana, and at the time South America and West Africa were joined, we just got parts of the Amazonia part, and we also got a section of the uh, North African part. In any case, this is a cross section sort of describing it. You have Laurentia here. This would be what was left, you know, the, the um, this is, you know, part of the uh, Taconic. Um, and what happened was, is once uh, the Taconic came, subduction was over this way, uh, then it switched. And uh, as Gandira was over, on its way over, Gandiria uh, and the crust uh, to the west side of that began to subduct under Laurentia, uh, made all sorts of uh, volcanic edifices that popped up through the Taconic area. Uh, and as Gandiria came over, it eventually slammed into Laurentia. Um, thrusting up over parts of this area here. Um, these are troughs and trench areas that are sort of located near the New Hampshire, Vermont border. Gandiria is this part right in here. Um, and then, of course, the, the slab that was dragging Gandiria over ended up uh, breaking off and sending more uh, igneous intrusions here. And, of course, the slab that was dragging Avalonia behind uh, of course, continued going under Gandaria, and of course, made a whole new volcanic belt here. Uh, and as this one dies and, and, and gets dragged off into oblivion, more, more material comes up. As this keeps going, this will also generate volcanic material, and eventually, this too will break off and, 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 um, and crash uh, not crash, but get sucked down into the mantle. And here it is here, you have uh, basically two different types of. Um, time periods of injections from granites and all sorts of stuff be, that is being created from these slabs being dragged down into the, um, the lithosphere. And eventually everything is all paired up with all sorts of volcanics here, volcanics here, there's some in here that aren't shown, uh, etc. And then eventually at 395 the whole thing shuts down, sh comes together and, sh and the Iapetus Coation uh, basically um, is shut. So actually, that's, this is uh, misleading. It, it, by 395, it is not shut. Uh, it's just that some there's when we see little squiggle lines, we just don't know the actual distance or it couldn't accurately be re represented it on this. So, so Gondwan is still on its way over. I think 365. I don't I've got to look at that time period again. But anyways, um, it is not shut. Gondwan is still on its way at 395. So you should have a drum roll on this, please. Dun, dun, dun. This is the... Um, this is really the purpose of doing all of this is to come really to this slide right here because this is going to be this this is talking about the actual geology of the Agunquit area and um, describing on how it formed way it got there uh, the origin and all sorts of stuff so around 380 million years ago in the Devonian period we had the approaching microcontinent of uh, of Avalonia we still had ancestral North America here, uh, probably had some more mountains sticking out here as from the Taconic. But what happens is, is as this continues to, to move east, it is eroding, it is throwing sediments into the ocean, and these sediments are piling up along the shelf, and eventually the sediments reach a point of, uh, maybe they reach a point where they end up cascading down the side of the slope in the form of turbidity currents turbidity currents, and it's these turbidity currents that make the Kittery Formation. And this is representing the Kittery Formation. Agunquit is here, it could be really anywhere in this area. 
um, you know, we don't really know how far it was, you know, I mean, it, it obviously varied because it eventually got shut and closed, but these sediments right here are spread out all over the, um, the Iapetus Ocean floor as this microcontinent was coming over, and obviously North America was also still eroding and it was putting in sediments, but what's interesting here is most all the sediments, at least in Agunquit in our area here, indicate that they arrived from the east. In other words, they did not come from Laurentia um, to our west, as you would think they would, as they do now. They were actually um, being driven and derived, and they were turbidity currents from the microcontinent of Avalonia off to the east. And even more nuts about that is, is I also put Mount Washington in here, which would, you know, obviously it's further, further, further west, but Washington itself also shows that most sediments, or at least the majority of sediments that made up the formation that Mount Washington is, uh, which is essentially, um, it was silts, it was, a, it was a relatively deep water area uh, with some sands, there were some sandy areas to it, but those also came from the east. So if Washington is receiving sediments from the east, it is much higher uh, in, from sea level than Ogunquit, um, it is also a much thicker stack. It's showing us that the sediments are in the, mile, in the order of miles thick. Although it's not the same sediment source as we have here in the Kittery Formation, it is similar. It's just a different area, but it, all, it has a lot of the same sediments, basically deeper, finer silt sediments mixed in with um, some, some sands. Now, of course, the Kittery Formation in Agunquit has more sand in it, meaning that it was obviously closer to the source. Another key. If you have sands and sands are always closer to the source of, of uh, erosion and sedimentation, so it makes sense that the Agunquan area definitely has more sand in its um, in its uh, in the Kittery Formation than that say does Mount Washington, and that makes sense because Washington would have been further out along the continental slope and thus receiving much finer sediments because it was further away. And it wasn't until you get the closing of Avalonia that you'd actually start to see. Uh, sands um, appear in the sediments of the Washington area, and there are places um, at, that they do. But they're not nearly as numerous as they are here. So in other words, Agunquit was a shallower uh, with closer proximity to Avalonia. Washington was a further off. And it's funny because when I go out there and I drive even further to, um, say, Littleton, uh, especially around the Littleton area, um, near that Vermont border up there, the there is just so much um, slate and schist, uh, and these are all deep water sediments from a, there, somewhere over here there's a trough that was, that was basically subducting this piece of ocean crust. It's not, it's not depicted here, but it would go something like that. And it is in this area where the, where the, where the trough is, you get, those are deep water sediments. They are very fine and they are tons of them. And you can, it's not difficult to see that the trench of subduction of the Iapetus Ocean is somewhere out near um, the Vermont New Hampshire border and the northern part of the state. It's all it's all silt sediments that have been metamorphosed to varying degrees, very little sand, very uniform indicating that was a trench area that was being filled. So again, Avalonia producing the sediments that's in the Kittery formation that makes up the marginal way, all of the sediments in the marginal way with the exception of the igneous rocks are formed in this way and through this this formation just basically current turbidity currents of sediment of sediment that piled up on the slope and then cascaded down mount washington although further to the west also received these sediments albeit um, a much more fine-grained version uh until later in time when once the the ocean actually began to close uh and in avalonia its prox proximity just got closer and closer and closer uh, in the very western part of the Iapetus, you were still getting uh, ocean sediments from uh, Laurentia. Uh, however, not nearly as much as we were getting from the eastern side. And we know that because Washington shows that sediments there were at least arriving from the east. And again, the Kittery Formation, it's a mixture of sands and silts all seen as alternating light and dark layers deposited as turbidity sediments off the offshore Avalonia microcontinent on the ocean floor. So boom, that's how we made up the sediments that made up our area. And here's a sort of a simple diagram. You, you have a shelf right here. You, let's say this is Avalonia. Uh, and what happens is you get um, periodic um, things pile up, but you know the, the shelf is fairly flat 
the slope is a little bit steeper and eventually things will pile up here on the edge and they like any sand pile it wants to equi e e equilibrate and it will um, cascade and fan out onto the um, the, the, the ocean ab abyssal floor and so here we got a sand uh, uh, basically a sand slump that went out to here um, here you've got some some silts and and then over here you got some clays now reality is is each one of these are gonna would probably have a sand and then a silt and then a clay out here but just to keep it simple I just put the three different um, ver layers that are going to uh, fall and really each one of these produces um, a sand part a silt part and a clay part um, unless for some reason that it's just the water is so calm that sand has not been deposited here in which case you just get the silts and the clays and then they cascade down but this just gives you an idea of how this works you get a lobe of material it kind of goes out and then it settles and then another one goes out another one goes out and so they just keep piling on top of each other and eventually you get a series of these when you cut through ah the kittery formation uh general litholog i think that's supposed to be a g uh descriptions the kittery formation is an early silurian uh, low green schist to amphibolite, uh, amphibolite, they're supposed to be facies, uh, of turbidite turbid sequence that is variable with limey, sandy, and, uh, sulfitic, uh, phyllite beds. That's Hussey said that. Um, when I see that there's sulfitic beds in there, uh, in the phyllite, and the phyllite, that kind of tells me that maybe some of these silts are derived from volcanic ash. Hmm? Makes sense. There was a lot of volcanism going on at this time. It was probably the most volcanic, elite active time um, in this area uh, for for at least 350 million years since. Um, it it uh, it was very active. It was very restless. There was lots of earthquakes, which were also uh, in tsunami that were triggering um, sediment flows in the ocean. So. Um, the primary sedimentary structures preserved in this unit are graded bedding, fluke cast, uh, flame structures, uh, occasional riprap mud, glass, cross. These are all just things that are caused by uh, currents, creatures, uh, whatever. Uh, it's just that it's just it's just showing that this is a muddy, uh, silty deposit that was able to be um, you know moved around. It was soft. Animals uh, you know moved moved stuff in there. They left. Uh, you know tracks or whatever all of those first for the most part have been basically destroyed by the compaction and the metamorphism of the sediments but when they were first there all you got to do is take a just think of a really mucky bottom of a of a lake that you would just sink in and, they, and that that's what it is uh stratigraphically um right Greg basically you know stated that uh that primary sediment structures uh, and the westward directions of these structures, uh, he used them to interpret that Kittery formation as a lobe uh, of a submarine fan in a continental rise environment. Again, just what I said, there's a, there's, there's a slope and then things pile up and they end up cascading and that becomes a fan. He also proposed that the primary sedimentary structures suggested an eastern depth residual source uh, in present day coordinates. Uh, stands true uh interbedded with countryite deposits uh from a northwest flowing current now that's basically saying that the primary driving force of the um of the water movement generally was flowing from the northwest and if i think about this um that makes sense the well i don't know because you have to understand that when this was coming together we were facing straight south so winds would have been coming actually we almost would have been southwest so yeah that makes sense that there was a if there was some sort of a a current and we were facing yeah we were facing um you know facing the uh we were in the wet yeah it seems very possible that this would be the basic the primary cur like today the Offshore here, the primary um, ocean direction is the southeast, north. I mean, yes, southwest, northeast, um, with the Gulf Stream. You know, it's just the Gulf Stream comes up, goes around, and then comes back down in a clockwise direction 
um, on the uh, over by Africa and uh, Spain and, 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 and Portugal and every ocean has a, a current a predominant current that goes you know a certain way right now any ocean basins they're kind of north north, north and south so therefore there's a, a clockwise uh, gyre that goes around above you know above the equator it's clockwise below the equator it's counterclockwise being that we were kind of close to the equator at an angle kind of like this when this all happened one can only wonder if it was clock yeah it would have gone like that so yeah it was a northwest so that makes sense I had to think about that for a minute so here's the Kittery formation in action right here and if you look at these and now I see it I've, every time I've done this uh, this talk I always get caught up in the fact that Hussey always said that they were overturned and this and that and you know I, it racked my mind forever to figure out but anyways you can see here that these are this is quartzite there's a lot of sand in this and if you can see here the current direction on this model is this way therefore the way these dip is showing that stuff cascades over cascades over cascades over cascades over and then forms these lines now these are going the opposite way so we know just by looking at if we were going to just you know ignore the fact that they've been flipped over you would say that current in relative current direction in relation to this was definitely going this way because these are ripple marks or dune marks that are pointing down meaning that sand came over and cascaded this way and you can also see them down here this was a time when you may have had a, a dune or a, or a numerous turbidity currents flowing and creating ripples uh, at an angle this might have been in an area where they were just completely everything was calm uh, and again another time when things were completely uh, calm and then more rough times right here when you're getting actual uh, flow to create the the ripple marks now if we were to flip these well hussey has got it right because this is the way that the open ocean is so east so that makes sense that they would have been coming this way and I believe he nailed it uh, this is just more um, pictures of the Kittery formation a little bit further uh, in the marginal way this one's taking taken in Devil's Kitchen although we've always called it Pounders Cavern it's the biggest um, uh, basically fault or crack or crevice in the marginal way you'll see it right after the lighthouse on the way to Perkins Cove the path is big giant U and this is inside of it um, this is slightly after that um, there's a little uh, another little embayment there or another little uh, uh, crevice and then these in, these I'm look when I'm looking at these I'm looking at them yeah I guess I'm, I'm looking at them from the same direction so uh, yeah these are just uh, every one of these is a flow this is more of sand fillite sand fillite dark is fillite white is sand and anything in between is a mixture and what this tells me is that um, everything here was deposited uh, you know everything's very laminate here so everything kind of just stacked on, on, on each other but again um, you know if you look at them from a different angle you might see it just depends really see, like right here I kind of see some this looks like sort of uh, ripples right here but it's just a big chunk of rock um, if I was standing here this would be about five feet high these are all over the marginal way um, and uh, again this is the Kittery formation this is like it in all its glory layer after, yeah there's definitely I can see some uh, some ripple marks right here so water water is going this way yeah and that makes sense because this would be facing east so yep yeah, uh, this is just more of a close-up and you can see the quartzite fillite quartzite fillite and alternating layers pretty cool uh, this is the cliff house now this is interesting in the sense that the beds have been turned so much so that they are now vertical so we don't really have a top and a bottom per se when, when they're 90 degrees we just kind of call them vertical and it's up to the geologist uh, to go out here this is the same thing a Kittery formation it's just been uh, it's just been uh, tilted a little more um, if we go back up here um, these near uh, the and the marginal way have a tendency to go like this so they're all sorts of different ways um, but when you get to the cliff house the the actual compression becomes much steeper and we have beds in that area that are you know essentially vertical uh, this right here it looks like a you know a bed of one of these it is not this is what we call a diorite uh, sill and at the time when it was intruded 
all of these were horizontal and this was intruded and it followed the, you know one of the weakened planes in between one of these layers but now that it's been turned straight up we it is now vertical uh, so what does that tell us well that tells us that that this was injected into this long before the collision truly happened because otherwise it might be taking a different direction but the fact that it follows suit means that that it was you know it's not cross-cutting really anything it's just following a fracture in here so this couldn't have happened much much later than this happened you know and when i say that i mean i'm talking maybe 100 million years given that these are almost 400 million years old uh it probably happened pretty early on and before deformation occurred here's just some more pictures of it i mean the, the layers out here are just beautiful and again sand phyllite sand and then you have some sometimes you'll find uh dikes in here or these aren't dikes these are actually sills following again they were horizontal when they were injected uh this guy right here is interesting though that is a felsic uh that's a felsic intrusion that cuts everything so whether or not that uh that got heated up enough to melt quartz and have it find some sort of fracture in here or it was an actual uh injection of some very felsic lava i don't know i'd have to go look at it but something happened here much later that because when this cross cuts everything it's younger in other words these had to be here in order for this to cross cut it so question is which way is up well when i did this before i used to sit there and say i have no idea i'd have to go out and look at it but i'm fairly certain that it's this way to the right because this this way is east and unless these have been overturned then if i stretch them back out they should go down this way and that means that that so up actually i'm sorry the way we're looking at it right now the direction down is this way the direction up is this way assuming that they haven't been overturned i think i remember identifying that if they're if they're not so in other words geez that's a hard one if they're not over if they're not if they haven't been flipped over the direction of source is to the right and if that's the case i believe that these should get younger as we go up this way to the left so younger is this way older is this way but really unsure because it could go either way um, but if they're not overturned then that would be the general direction this is just a uh, little closer version of it in different area um, and again the cliff house so yeah if i really wanted to to, to to figure it out i'd have to go down here again and look at these and figure out if there's because each one of these is going to have the rougher stuff on the bottom which is first and then as as every as the water calmed down they would get the sediments would get lighter and lighter as you move up and that's the way and, and wherever so so it's so turbidity current has bigger stuff on the bottom and then lighter stuff as it as it calms down and so if, so if you find heavier grains on the bot on to the right and then lighter grains to the left then that means that the right is the bottom so anyway it, it can make you crazy if you think about it too much geologic map of southern maine uh so gunkwit's kind of right here marginal ways right there oh i'm sorry gunkwit's right there that's the marginal way this is cape medic um what we have here is we have um this is um this is the triassic egemenicus complex this is an intrusion that happened in the triassic time and it is completely unrelated to these plutons right here these are devonian the pink are devonian plutons although this one is a permian one um and then the sedimentary rocks are in green so you've got the berwick formation you've got the elliott formation you've got the kittery formation which are all fairly similar um now the reason i'm bringing this out is that these plutons here these three here are much different than this one here and the reason being is that the th this these plutons here are essentially derived uh during the during or somewhat immediately after the mountain building episode of the of the acadian orogeny and as the plate went down it melted and it produced lavas that came up and through now 
the, due to the somewhat felsic nature of these, I may even think that these might even be related to decompressional melting. In other words, once the Acadian orogeny ended and the mountains began to erode and the weight began to get lifted off, then you've got eruption. Then sometimes what will happen is the base of the crust, because it's not kept down under a lid, although it was pushed into more hot material, uh, will begin to melt, kind of like opening a, uh, a uh, Coca-Cola bottle. And when it does, it begins to start sending up plutons. And you can see that these are all fairly well spaced. That might be what these are. And a lot of times it's common after orogenies for, for, for mountain ranges that were formed during the orogeny to get injected and stitched together um, at a later date once mountain building has ceased and erosion has taken place to basically stitch the, uh, the range together. Um, basically, you're just injecting a bunch of lava into it, into the island arc, and you're kind of just gluing it all together, and it becomes a much better, more, more, more uh, 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 complete unit. The Triassic eruption here of the Agamenicus complex, uh, and take note here, there's also the Kittery, uh, not Kittery, but this is a Cretaceous uh, eruptive event. We think that these, we, we think that this for certain, uh, we think that these are related to uh, the New England hotspot somehow. Um, now, this also could have been, this could have occurred through an injection of, uh, of the opening of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, however, it, the, the, the fact that it's very round, it sort of has concentric formations in it. I'm going to go, this is probably a hotspot um, eruption as opposed to a rifting event. Rifting events would be much longer. Uh, this is probably also just a residual of this, maybe, I don't know, or, but this is another 100 mil, million years later, and this is also, this could also be related to New England SEMA. I don't know, there, but there's one here, and there's one here, and this is also Cretaceous, so you've got, it's almost as if maybe this pooled a little bit, and you had some after effects, I don't know. Uh, um, the, oh, down here is what we call the Rye Complex. Um, this has been sort of a mysterious uh, formation for a long time. We originally seemed to think that it might have been Neoproterozoic, but um, I guess they've got it listed here as Ordovician. But in any case, it's definitely older than the Kittery Formation. Uh, this is in Ordovician time. It has a tendency, though, to have, it looks like marine deposits, more or less, uh, following suit with these. It's just at a, another time period prior to these being deposited. So the area of deformation for the Acadian orogeny is outlined in this uh, beautiful shape right here. Uh, I don't know what to call it. But uh, in any case, everything in here is, is part of the Acadian orogeny. Now, Avalonia would be more or less here and here. Uh, and then everything in this area here would be Gandaria terrain. And that's why you can see there's just so much different. It's just a junk mix of ocean sediments and island arcs that got stretched and pulled as a good uh, ripped it off of Amazonia and brought over here. And it, this doesn't really show you that the terrains as well, um, but, but but believe me, this is Avalonia right here, Meguma's out here, um, Avalonia comes right down through here, um, this is the, the Taconic Orogenies out here, and then this is all Acadian deformation in here. Uh, generalized map of the tectonics. Uh, so again, you see the Avalonia terrain here, a massive strike slip fault here that may have been gone one way originally and then switched directions in the other. Weird, but may have happened. Um, you can think of this as a San Andreas style fault. So we think, we think that when this originally, when, when Avalonia kind of came in, it sort of came in at this angle in relation to this, and then it sort of slid down this fault right here. Well, when Africa, finally came in and hit from this direction, well, it kind of pushed everything back up this way. And again, this fault is likely um, opened and uh, and you allowed movement to go back this way. We're not 100% sure, but it seems like it kind of had two ways of movement on it. Uh, so Avalonia, Gandaria terrain all in here. Like Again, volcanic islands and ocean floor sediments, just like I said. Uh, tectonic, map, tectonic map of New England. This is a really good one. You got your Again, right here, Avalonia, right? Meguma. Now, what this is really showing is it's showing the, the details and the guts of what I've been talking about. 
So anything in blue out here, you really are going to just sort of more or less, this is Laurentia, uh, this is Laurentia derived. In other words, anything that's out here more or less had sedimentation uh, related to North America, Laurentia, what have you. And this right in here is what we would call the Taconic Arc. So the Taconic Arc, we know, was an island arc that had Laurentia affiliation, which means it wasn't far away, and ended it, it ended up getting dragged and, and, and popped in and accreted onto North, uh, to Laurentia. Behind that, again, came the, this is, the yellow is the Gandaria terrain, and again, a hodgepodge mess of island arcs, sediments, uh, intrusives, just everything you can imagine being stretched and dragged and then accreted on in this area. And again, you've got your White Mountains down in here. You've got your Sebago Lake here. You've got all sorts of crazy, you have an island arc uh, uh, terrain through here. You also have areas where there's, uh, where there, there is, um, uh, Ophiolites. And Ophiolites are very important. There are areas where um, where the actual ter uh, ocean crust has been thrown up and over um, some of these some of these terrains. I believe that's the Chain of Island Massive right here, Chain of Lakes Massive, um, and then you have some arcs. I have an arc that got wedged up over it because I've been here and I've seen pieces of, um, of of deep into sections of the oceanic crust right here. There's a whole uh, suite right here that goes all the way from the crust to the gap. I mean to the um, Gabros down into the serpentines uh, you're getting a really good p look at the interior section of oceanic crust right through here uh, and of course you've got your plutons you've got your late stage pluton here after mountain building ceased uh, and if, then of course you've got your coastal uh, volcanic belt right here um, and also down here uh, and again you've got some avalon terrain here and it, this is all gandaria terrain this is the guts of new of, you know new england maine new hampshire and it's all volcanic sediments and ash and silts. So it's just a mishmash of, mishmash of everything. This is uh, a better way, uh, not a better way, but just another map to, to kind of give you an idea of how things happen. You have the Grenville terrain over here, you know, the formation of Rodinia 1.25 to 0 0.9. You have the Taconic orogeny right here, about 480 to 440. You got some more island arcs right here and, and trenches that form. You have an island arc here, you have an island arc here, and you have an island arc here. And if you've noticed, they get sort of get younger as you uh, come down. And these areas in here, so you're going to have a, an arc, a trough, an arc, a trough, and then an arc. And this is really uh, also, you would say that this is, you know, this is Avalonia right here, and then Avalonia comes back down out here. Um, but again, you sort of have a dome, trench, a dome, a trench, a dome, it's, you know, and that's the, sort of the way it is. Everything just got compacted like that. And again, everything gets younger as you go from west to east. And of course, marginal wave right there. This is a great map to really give you an idea. Now, what I haven't put in here is, is, is after you have the Taconic orogeny, you have what's in here, and this is also part of Gandiria, um, is you have a series of just right up and through here and here, of trench deposits. So in other words, once this mountain belt got built um, and subduction flipped, you needed to start dragging stuff under this whole area. And as you did, you were scraping off sediments from the ocean floor, as well as creating a, a trench that was filling up with sediments derived from these areas in these island arcs. And it all fills up right in here. And you've got a whole area of slates and schist right here that are just undeniable when you drive in this area. They're, 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 they're very obvious and very easy to see. And then you get an arc, you get a nice mountain range, you get the, you know, you get the Longfellow Mountains, and then you get various mountain ranges in here that are basically the guts and the cores of these arcs. And then you have another trough where there's lots of, you know, slates and schist in here, and then you have another arc right here, and you can see the, 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 the granites and the, the hard rocks of the cores of these, and then you have a whole area of ocean bottom sediments right here, and then of course you have um, Avalonia right here and and sediments here were being and here were being derived off of here probably to some extent a little bit here but that's the gist of it North America 
Taconic Orogeny, Trench Deposits, uh, Trench Deposits, an Island Arc, an Eroded Island Arc, uh, Trench Deposits, another Island Arc right here. Now you've got more trench deposits, or we'll just say ocean bottom deposits, and then you have another island arc over here, and it just keeps going out until basically whatever's out here at some point ripped it off and went went away. So if you wanted to know what um, what it looked like here, uh, minus the trees, of course, uh, as the Acadian orogeny was really beginning to get going, um, you would see that there were a lot of thrust belts. There was a lot of mountain lifting uh, happening. Things were starting to rise. The ocean was closing. And what you would see is all these sediments that have been laid down are now beginning to tilt and lift. So we'll say at the beginning around 360 that your mountains here in New England were new. They were kind of probably looked a lot like, well, probably in the same stage as say the Olympic mountains out west. Uh, again, minus the trees, because um, they certainly were different. But you're getting a brand new mountain range that's going to be nice and sharp because all the erosion is just starting. It, it's starting to show you uh, it, that, that it's more of the core of what the basement rocks looked like. And you can see that this is a fault here, this is a fault here. Whatever's happening here, things are probably moving this way and pushing these up and over each other. It's not often you would go down and then they would go back, but that does happen. I would think that they're going this way. Hard to tell. Uh, this is uh, a late Devonian uh, period landscape. You've got uh, the beginnings of trees. Um, we know that they kind of started to make headway in the Silurian, maybe, you know, plants in the Ordovician. You've got some amphibians here. Um, these are your, your biggest uh, animals at the point, and the amphibians are the ones that really made the, you know, they made the great leap for mankind, you could say, because they obviously still are showing a very um, aquatic uh, swimming design. You know, this is basically a creature that can move very well through water, as you can see by its design. However, uh, fins have now been replaced by low uh, squatty legs. The animal can now um, breathe air as opposed to just absorb it. It's um, and it now has legs for locomotion, but it has to stay near the water because if it doesn't, um, its skin is going to dry out. Um, it's not until we get to the reptile, which is coming next as a derivative, uh, as a, basically this will evolve into a reptile, um, and the scales solve the problem of the drying out of the continent, Pangea, when it starts, and we're starting to bring Pangea together here, and it's starting to lift. Uh, the inland seas that these creatures were all like, you know, feeling safe and, and lovely in um, has decided to start to dry up. The climate is starting to change. It's starting to cool. Um, and it's causing these creatures, uh, their domain has begun to shrunk, and now they need to move or die or adapt. So all your those are your choices. You adapt or die. That's it. And so what they've done is they've managed to find some sort of a locomotion. Uh, the tail, it will start to, to come in. Uh, Maeve, I, actually, that's a, I don't know about that. Um, yeah, it does, because amphibians tend to lose their tails. Um, and the mouth is starting to develop uh, some sort of teeth, um, because this creature may or may not be carnivorous. I'm not sure yet. They did become carnivorous. In fact, most amphibians are. They eat insects and stuff like that. Uh, the eyes um, are still relatively uh, aquatic, but they are moving forward and to give this animal more... A vision in front of them which is very typical of a predator so you're seeing the transition from aquatic uh you know aquatic and marine type uh fauna to more of a land dwelling and you're seeing the transit the problem is is this guy just cannot go too far away from the water or it dries out and we know what that means for an amphibian so here we are in the mississippian period about 345 million years ago we got our trenches right here. Uh, we've had Avalonia come in and dock up against here. You've got an inland sea here where, you know, uh, offshore of New England, Nova Scotia, um, Gunkwit's here. Uh, the Appalachians are just absolutely getting jacked as everything starts to shut. This is what's left. This ocean now is, we refer to this as the Rayic Ocean um, because once Avalonia collides, uh, Avalonia, between Avalonia and Laurentia, is what we call the Iapetus. Uh, when it first began to close, the island arc that formed the Taconics 
got close and we call that the conic seaway the conic seaway close and that was just basically the most western part of say the i op it is ocean behind that was the you know i op it is proper and then once again daria and avalon you have adhered to north america the ocean behind that is referred to as the ray of ocean and this is the ray of ocean and this is the one that will this is the last one that closes once um africa um docks up against us and you can see everything is coming together you've got rift zones trenches like this area of the world is uh it's gnarlier than indonesia right now it is very volcanic it is very unstable there's a lot of action a lot of volcanic a lot of uh, earthquakes uh it's just not a very friendly place to be um and that's because two continents are about to uh about to collide at 325 we have a little bit of a connection here super deep trenches here this is all coming up out of the ocean uh this is going to close right around uh this looks like about pennsylvania uh north carolina area virginia um this is what's left of the rayic ocean here what's left of the rayic ocean here but we are now have a continent to continent uh collision and mountains here are going to just start growing uh they're going to start going past 15,000 feet upwards for 20 um we still got a little bit of ocean here uh this is a little bit for this is kind of nova scotia but and now gunkwit's kind of just located right in a gigantic mountain field so the carboniferous is consists of the mississippian period as well as the pennsylvanian i always remember it as m becomes 4p so it's mississippi then pennsylvanian um and these are the the tectonics of it uh, i always kind of go through this to grenville we already went through that that was rodinia rodinia broke up we had a nice passive sea uh passive margin here um we had the taconic arc come over it it or it welded we had the uh the exotic crust of the gandaria train uh, and here it is on its way over when we had avalonia here all of these combined and then of course africa comes behind it and here we are this is where we are right now we are in the final stages the rayic oceans right here like i said this is iapetus this is the rayic um all right i fixed that so this is the taconic arc you have the iapetus on this side iapetus on this side <clears throat> this is sort of the gandaria terrain and you still have this is the taconic now it's accreted you have the iapetus and you still have iapetus on the other side of gandaria as this comes so what happens is subduction starts going under gandaria as well and it also starts going under um the taconics and then this gets dragged over but yet you still have iapetus on the other side of the ray of the of the um gandaria train now i put the ray here because this is avalonia and on the other side of avalonia is the ray ocean so now that avalonia has has come over in this one you can see this piece here this piece here you have what's left is the ray ocean and then africa's right behind that and this shows all the terrains mixed and slammed into each other so that's what's going on and then of course in the mesozoic we rift and then present day you know we know the atlantic oceans there we just hit so we're on our way to the collision of the of africa which will be the allegheny and orogeny i just wanted to make that point clear because it's a bit confusing by this uh by this um slide anyway so now we're looking at uh what would what would the um what would new england area look like once you started having the acadian orogeny occur well you definitely see mountains like this um and you know the madhorns actually a really good example of of what we look at because most of this here is what we would say iapetus ocean sediments below um and then up here believe it or not is a piece of um crust that was offshore more or less or part of a microcontinent that got lifted up and over so in other words this piece here is much on the matterhorn is much younger than this piece here which in reality it should be the opposite but you have all these faults that start crunching and riding up over each other that you take a stack of cards and you just push them one way they're going to ride up over each other that is essentially what happens so we have the upper part everybody knows this in the geology world that the upper part of the matterhorn is of african origin and then the lower part is mediterranean and so it's basically you have that's totally 
you know what we'd expect from a thrust fault that that this piece here was somewhere back here and ended up getting pushed up and over all of this and this and that's why the matterhorn is such an interesting mountain um <clears throat> now the only thing i disagree about this with um is that the alps are probably the most quickly eroding um mountain range right now that we can think of it's literally the alps are literally falling apart the crustal root under it um from the subducting slab has basically uh done its job there's not a lot holding this mountain range up anymore um, enough material has been lifted off of it and is moving out across the into europe and into the, the, the mediterranean um, and so what's happening is you're getting uh you're just getting these uh the the, the, the alps are just literally falling apart uh you know nothing got that high metamorphosed up above so the rocks are fairly soft and so what happens is you're just getting everything falling apart and filling in into the valleys and eroding so it's just a very quickly eroding it's it reached its zenith and now it's on its way out so that's the only thing i don't disagree with because that right now the arcadian mountains or the mountains that make up the acadian raji should be on their way up and not eroding fast but this is about the right height this is what you might see again you know minus the green and the human being of course so now we're going to get into you know 330 million years ago and your uh our mountains here are going to start to look like this they're getting bigger they're eroding um but you know the amount the area is lifting so quickly that erosion just cannot keep up with it and now you're stripping away the soft stuff but now you're getting the real guts of the mountains and you've just got absolutely majestic gigantic peaks that would be making up the area that we live right now um albeit they haven't reached their zenith yet but once they do you can really think of the idea that if you wanted to be oh i don't know let's just say that this was we were looking at a gunk with 330 million years ago from wherever uh you'd have to understand that they'll, so these what 20 miles is what three three four miles so um you're looking at a gunk with being buried somewhere in another three three miles below this so <laughs> You're just all of this is going to be gone by the time we come to to, to see the light in, you know in a manner of speaking so this is what was on top of us by about five miles at one point about 330 million years ago real pretty ah the mississippian period so now we're into the carboniferous and a lot of things have happened life has decided to really um take off uh we are you know evolution is doing <clears throat> doing its thing we went through the hard parts from single cells to multi cells to actual organisms and my god things are taking off and this is a good shot right here because we have two things going on right here we have now developed uh what i would prefer to say as probably the gnarliest um uh, apex predator of the amphibian family that has ever existed uh we also have uh, a very early uh an archaeosaur i believe i'm not sure if they if it goes back that i think it might be a little bit later but you have something here that is beginning to resemble what we are going to um that are going to become dinosaurs and so at some point um in this period in the carboniferous we have a creature that sort of looks like this that ends up one ends up going to be a sauropsid um so sore like dinosaur um which ends up going into going to evolve into crocs um crocodiles uh reptiles um and anything that's really a gigant really a reptile but we also have one that splits this way and becomes a synapsid and a synapsid is what a, a mammal is and so even though we still both go into reptilian forms one goes to develop uh dinosaurs and birds and crocs the other one goes and develops uh mammal-like reptiles of the later um paleozoic but it actually evolves into true mammals so the difference being is that the seropsid i believe has two holes in the head the synapsid has three uh not to mention we have different dentitions um the heart goes from a three to a three and a half chambered uh, at this point in the amphibian, I, I'm, I'm, I always kind of get this wrong, but um, the amphibian, I believe, has a three-chambered heart. I think fish has two, but this has three and a half. So this amphibian right here, 
I think, I think it's called uh, Europs. Europs. Anyway, um, this is about nine feet long, six to nine feet long. It has a mouth uh, like an alligator, <clears throat> and its eyes perfect for just sitting, you know, submerged, and the eyeballs can see what it needs to see. And then it makes this is also an amphibian over here. Um, then it makes its attack. And believe me, you do not want to encounter this thing anywhere near. This is the apex part of the time. This thing will definitely go after this, but this will not be going after this. Now, what's the advantage here? This thing is squatty and it crawls and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and is probably somewhat locked to near water because it does not have scales and it cannot go too far away without drying out. This guy, however, can easily outnumber, be more nimble than this guy and easily outrun and look at the a mode of transportation it can move quickly this guy right here is going to have the advantage as the earth gets drier and we don't have the the the, the safety of the water um, and as well this thing has probably developed some sort of a scale so that the skin doesn't dry out so the amphibians have seen their heyday they are produced their their largest uh, of the time uh, to, to, to date um, apex predator, but we know that the Carboniferous, the Mississippi and Pennsylvanian times were very wet. We came out of a very wet period in the Devonian, and things are now, and we go into the Permian, are going to start to dry out. And as they do, as the as as parts of Laurentia and and, and northern Africa and and all these continents come together, they're going to start to rise, and desert areas are going to start to be created. And these guys just are not going to make it because they'll, 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 they'll survive in areas where there's good swamps and where it's warm. But as it turns out, all the area that was really swampy and everything, um, i.e. the, you know, the, 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 uh, the United States of North America, Europe, um, parts of Africa, Siberia, all of these places that produced that were just huge giant swamps are now being lifted miles into the air by tectonics. And all of the and the temperatures are dropping, and the waters are drying up, and ice is coming, and these guys just do not have the ability to to adapt. These guys do, and so you know what comes next. So the late Carboniferous period, about 306 million years ago, you've got Algonquin here. We're kind of near the equator. We have a east-west gigantic Himalayan-sized mountain range there. Um, this whole area here and here is beginning to lift. We have the Tethys Sea, which is a big ocean off to our east um, that will end up, uh, basically this is a proto-Indian ocean, um, and believe it or not, this whole thing is going to get subducted under this area here, which will end up becoming Asia. Um, we have glaciation down here, which again is leading to drying up of parts of Pangaea because the earth is, because we have a lot of uh, land that's sucking up a lot of water and making, um, you know, glacial uh, glaciers. So these seas dry up, the amphibians don't like it, the reptiles are now getting their chance to start moving. Pennsylvania period, now, I mean, this is it. This is when you're looking at 20, 25,000 foot mountains, a gunkwit is smack dab in the middle, you know, it's probably three or four miles in the air, it's probably freezing, there's no trees, um, this is not a friendly place, you're in the midst of uh, supercontinent with massive fluctuations of temperatures, lots of snow, lots of uh, rain over here, a lot of erosion going on. Um, the mountains are shedding an enormous amount of materials that, believe it or not, go all the way out a lot further than you would believe. We find sources or sediments from the Appalachians as far out as, you know, New Mexico, uh, Arizona. We find them up here uh, in, you know, uh, Ontario. We find them near the Bay of Fundy. We find them, I mean, they, uh, Hudson Bay. They were gigantic and they shed for hundreds, if not thousands of miles on each side. So, yeah, Pennsylvania. Later Pennsylvania, and this is the end. Uh, now you've just got absolute, uh, the, the continent of Africa has made its way. We are seeing uh, just gigantic thrust and folds. Um, crustal thickening here is probably in the order of 60 miles thick, just like the Himalayas. We've even got deformation uh, thousands of miles out and around. We got uh, deformation even here in the in the in the in the in the, in the, the Pacific Southwest of today. Um, 
We do have some melting of the glaciers. Some water is beginning to flood some of the areas of the continents. Um, but again, Gunkwich just smack dab in the middle of, of, of Earth's largest mountain range. You wouldn't like it here at all, unless you were like, you know, you wanted, you, you loved uh, camping out in pure cold. All right, so Carboniferous period, Pennsylvania period, tectonics. We have gone through this Wilson cycle. We have collided Africa, here it is. Um, and we have now made a Himalayan sized mountain range. And the eventually, the driving force behind Africa is going to lose steam because it just cannot go any further and things are going to start to shift. But at this time, this is it. This is the peak. This is the biggest mountains that we've ever seen in this coastline. Well, I don't know. The Grenville was probably just as, just as big, um, but this is as big as the Appalachians get. And over here, you can see the mountain range right here. You can see other mountainous areas, uh, you know, that have been uh, affected or built by uh, other various things. You have sediments being deposited. You've got deeper offshore sediments. You've got carbonates out here. Because again, remember this is the equator, so it's warm. Um, so you're probably getting reefs out here, uh, and you've got all sorts of, of sediments right in here. So, so yeah, the Appalachians are shedding um, their skin, so to speak. And here is the time chart. So we are here. This is a very long-lived um, mountain building episode as Africa has decided to collide with North America or Laurentia. Um, and this will be it. Once we've done this and, and they stop pushing against each other, they will begin to separate as the mountain. So you don't get a lot of intrusions in the northern area. Like for the most part, uh, the Allegheny uh, Alleghenian orogeny did not really affect northern New England too much. Um, it was really a southern New England event, uh, as well as the Ozark area. Um, it did a lot there. Um, so you can see in the timeline, uh, so Acadian was what, you know, about 4 to 365, Meguma slightly after, and then the Alleghenian starts out about, what, 335 to about, I don't know, 260 maybe. <clears throat> These are, you have the Grenville cycle, you have the spreading, the Iapetus, the Taconic Seaway, uh, Iapetus beginning to close, Iapetus does close. Um, you get strike slip faulting um, along uh, through New England through uh, shearing. Again, it goes one way at first and then <laughs> turns around and goes the opposite way, <clears throat> at least we think. Uh, and then um, then we have uh, the Raic shuts down um, as um, because like I said, the Raic Ocean was between Acadia, and, 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 and um, basically between the Acadian orogeny and the Alleghenian, and basically it's between uh, Avalonia and um, Africa, and that's what this is. A Meguma is just another sliver of a microcontinent that's kind of in the mix of it, but it's not doesn't separate an ocean, so that's how the Rayic Ocean comes to form. Yes, here we are. This is what it would look like. Gunquit's about six miles to eight miles down underneath all of this, and we will not be seen for about 300 million years. And this is no, I mean, we know this by looking at the size of our, um, I mean, the size, we know this by looking at the minerals, the metamorphic mineral grade under uh, Maine and New Hampshire. They are high grade, um, and high grade only forms miles below the surface under extreme uh, pressures and temperatures. And the only way you get those as you guessed it, stacking continental material on top of one another until it gets so thick it begins to change the minerals, not just from, you know, slates to schist, but we're talking into gneiss and, uh, and uh, well, gneiss is about the hardest rock you're going to get. And all you're going to do is just start growing bigger minerals until eventually it gets hot enough that the, even the gneiss melts and it either turns to a granite or it just completely melts. We didn't get that far, but we got close. So that the only way you're going to get that is through something like this. Pennsylvanian period landscape. So the Pennsylvania period is interesting because it's really the a very warm period before um, before we get into what Pangaea does, which is really cools the climate. Um, the Pennsylvania period was warm, uh, a, a time of very large insects and a time of a lot of oxygen. Oxygen, uh, insects breathe through their skin. So if you have a if you have a lot of oxygen and you have a sort of a, 
an organism that just kind of breathes straight through your skin and really the only constricting unit on it is the amount that it can breathe to produce um, you know the materials to, to build the, the body well the insects are going to do very very well in the in the carboniferous because there's a ton of oxygen and it's warm and plenty of food so the insects reach gigantic proportions at, in, in this particular time this thing's probably about eight or nine feet in diameter uh, I think this one's about three or four. Um, you would not want to bump into this. This is a very scary, uh, uh, you know, sort of centipede-looking thing. Uh, but I, if I remember correct, it is nothing but, vero you know, it's just ferocious. Um, it would kill just about, and this is sort of the one of the apex predator of this time, as far as the insects go. Uh, now we're into the Permian period, which is uh, starts at about 290. 291 I think some around there and this is uh, this is Pangaea and all its glory we have the Tethys Sea we got the central Pangaea mountains a gunquit right there in the middle of a supercontinent uh, the Tethys Sea here the Paleo Tethys Sea rather uh, is now more or less enclosing and this has dire effects this ocean begins to close and heat up um, and not only when it does heat up it starts pumping a ton of moisture because we're in the we're near the equator so the winds are going this way and then you have massive uh you have a massive range of um mountains right here so there's erosion is just going uh ballistic here so you've got lots of erosion lots of rain coming in uh you know a lot of mucky um dark um and water here you know from all the silt coming off probably probably getting pretty anoxic um and heating up because there's just no no longer a, a circulation through this so the water actually in a sense becomes stagnant um, and that's the same as here and here now over here because the winds are blowing westerly what you have over here is the winds are blowing off and sending warm water over against this bank here which is probably going through here but in the same time in the area off here you're bringing up cold water and the cold water at least for this time is is regulating somewhat of the of the climate um, but it's losing because when you when you lost the current that went through here the ocean current you lost the ability to control the temperature of this part of the ocean and this part over here and when they get really warm they, they start to really uh, have a lot of storms they have a lot of uh, monsoon action and what happens is is that the rain just erodes these mountains sucks out the co2 starts dumping it into the ocean at alarming rates um, now, normally this would help cool the climate, but I think it actually had an opposite effect because, because it started to really make a lot of the ocean around this area sort of anoxic. Um, and when you have anoxic oceans, you've got big problems. Um, things can't live, uh, you know, shells start getting eaten, and then the more bicarbonate you put in, the more acidic the oceans become. And the more acidic these oceans become, the less things can live. And the less you have things that can live, the less you're sucking out uh, CO2. Um, so you're getting a lot of CO2 put in, but there's nowhere for it to go um, because you're killing off a lot of stuff. So it starts to accumulate in the oceans. And, and, and again, uh, this has a dire effect. Now, you can see that these light areas over here, these suggest deserts, and they are. This used to be a very warm area all through here. But now that you've lifted this area miles high and you've created a shadow and there's not water on here, you're not able to control the temperature back here as much. And so you have massive fluctuations of heat and cold that causes a lot of problems on life. For all this time, life has been, the temperatures have been fairly stable. Well, they are not anymore, and they are fluctuating madly, and this is going to have dire effects on life. So between the erosion, the drawdown of CO2, uh, the melting of these glaciers, there's a whole, the, basically the climate is being ripped in a bunch of different directions right now. And what ends up happening is one way or the other loses. And once Pangaea, um, once we start to lose this ice down here uh, and the climate really starts going, it actually goes into a runaway effect. And the runaway effect is what causes the largest mass extinction um, that we've ever seen. And we really think that the only thing to blame is Pangaea coming together. And the effects of it were dire. You cut off the circum uh, equatorial current and it just really screws up the oceans or at least the life forms what they were used to um, and again you start drawing you, at, at first at first when this comes together it actually the climate cools 
because you have such a large land mass and you have a large land mass over the poles, it cools the climate. And when you cool the climate, you start to get everything drawing off the continental shelves. And again, you take all the things that, if you have a lot of organisms living on continental shelves and you drain them and they're in water, you have two choices, you adapt or die. And these organisms that are out here, it just seems to have happened so quickly that they didn't really have the time to, to adapt as well. And we start to see the earth starting to, to the, the climate is causing stress on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the life forms at the time because you've gone from a very stable climate to something that has massive fluctuations. Not you have a glacier down, a, uh, you know, a continental glacier here, um, and then the sea levels are dropping. So these things are, are now unable to, to adapt to that. And when you drain the sea level, um, you have more surface area of the, of the continents, which makes the climate get even more extreme. And then something happens. Something happens in the later Permian where the cooling stops and then everything heats up radically fast. And it causes a really, really mass, it, it, it causes the Permian extinction called the Great Dying. And it literally, um, it, 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 it almost brought us to the brink. Uh, we, we think close to 96% of organisms were, wet, were whacked when this happened. So again, you know, when the continents are spread, things are more mellow, you can control temperatures, but when they all come together and then you cut off the equatorial current, um, you really change everything. And, you know, if animals, if they cannot adapt, they go extinct. And oddly enough, um, a lot of things, the trilobites that were around for, you know, a couple hundred million years get whacked. Uh, corals get whacked. I mean, it really, the, the sea takes a huge hit, uh, again, because of the acidification um, of the oceans. And as the climate began to warm, you became more acidic. And then, even worse, you became anoxic. Um, you have a lesser ability to hold oxygen and water the warmer it gets. And so, it was, you know, you've got a two-prong effect. And if you're killing things that transport CO2 to the bottom of the ocean, well, and you can't do that anymore, and a lot of CO2 is going into the ocean, well, CO2 starts piling up in here, well, it, it also gets out, too. I mean, you know, the volcanoes are going to start when this thing starts to rift, um, and the CO2 starts to really pile up, and that causes massive problems, because now you went from a cooling climate, now it's going to start heating up in it very quickly, uh, and then releasing more CO2 and acidifying the oceans even more and making them even more anoxic and now you've got a problem Because not is it just the climate, but now the oceans are dying and again the, the Permian extinction almost took us out and we really there's nothing else to blame but Pangaea and we're, we're gonna get to the to the Permian extinction I do a whole thing on it and it is a fascinating uh, It's also really frightening because it's kind of what we're doing today. So next Permian period right here. As you can see, we are just landlocked with Africa. We have mountains, but the mountains are starting to level a little bit now. They're not as big as they once were. That's the thing about giant mountain ranges. You know, you think that they're unmovable, but they really don't last that long. One could say that in 60 million years, you know, you could erode uh, a mountain range down quite a bit. Um, However, the Appalachians are a completely resilient mountain range, and they just seem to be the gift that keeps on giving. Because even though you erode them, the roots are so deep that isostatic rebound keeps bringing up uh, from the depths the deeper roots of the Appalachians. And as it turns out, the depths, the deeper parts of the Appalachians are very tough. They're basement rock. They're gneisses and granites, and they do not erode easy. And so. They, 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 they definitely put up a really good fight. So, you know, we're probably looking still in the 20,000 foot range for our mountains at this point in time. So that's 290. This is 275. Again, the mountains have eroded down a little bit. And you can see the sediments. These are all sediments from the Appalachian Mountains right here. This whole area. All of this. It even fills in here. See, it's starting to fill in. These are all sediments from the Appalachian Mountains. And at 260, you know, is this beginning to extend? It seems awfully early for it, but you kind of see it. I don't know. I think what this more or less is, is that the Appalachians are rebounding. Um, 
but we know that in another 100 million years, I mean, another 60 million years, this thing opens. So it, it is possible that with the mountains eroding, that we are starting to extend a little bit here. I mean, it looks like it, because it looks like it could just be water. We are getting warmer through the Permian, so water might start to invade a little bit more. So I'm not going to go, it's, yeah, you're still seeing that. So I don't think it's extending yet, but it might be in the very initial stages of it. So anyways, 260, 275, yeah. Probably just a higher sea level. But this is a change of things to come. This is going to start going this way. This will start going this way. And guess what? Africa leaves. So the Permian period. Here we are, the tectonics. Gigantic Appalachian Mountains. All sorts of sediment way out there. Uh, you know, you've got, now you've got actually a trench over on um, the western side of the uh, Laurentia. And this is the beginning um, the first, one of the first phases of the Rocky Mountains to start to build. So we start getting subduction over here. You're starting to get um, some island arc action, some, some uh, mountains popping up in volcanoes. And this is the beginning of the state of one of the first stages of the Rocky Mountains uh, when they start, the, you know, actually we'll say the ancestral Rocky Mountains. But again, we are still the kings. Everything over here is doing well. And of course the Rocky Mountains are in marine deposits, um, you know, uh, even over here, some of it's deep. You've got a trench over here. So, yeah, start of the Rocky Mountains. And now we have gone past the, uh, the Allegheny and Orogeny. Africa's hit, and we're kind of in a period right in between before everything starts to split apart. And so I put this line right here. Timeline chart, yep, we are above Pangaea, and now we are about to uh, uh, basically embark on the opening of the Atlantic. So once everything comes together, the Allegheny, orogeny, you know, this is Pangaea pushing uh, uh, Africa, pushing against us, the supercontinent, and it stays stable for a while. But at around 200 million years, everything begins to change. So 250 million years ago, this is what you might see. Again, minus the trees, but block those out. You'd see some peaks that have still got some snow on them. Probably about, I don't know, eight to 10,000 feet. Um, probably a little more rounded than this but this is the end of a gigantic uh himalayan size orogeny that has survived for you know close to um you know 150 million years it's it's so it's been there for a long time and it's it's you know and, and the continents are no longer pushing the crust the crust is relaxing erosion is taking away the weight and the mountains are beginning to really show signs of some serious erosion Pangaea in all her glory. Uh, again, the uh, rift zone that is now opened up on the outer, uh, on the western side of Pangaea, the Paleo Sea. Uh, you have um, this is <laughs> this is actually I, I, this is what will become the uh, Mediterranean. Um, this is sort of what's what was le what's left of it today. But all of this here is going to get sucked under this area over here, which is Southeast Asia. Um, you got India right here. Uh, you got Aus this Australia right here. You got Antarctica here, Africa, uh, South America, North America, uh, Siberia, and then this is of course uh, Baltica to jerk. So this is what we're seeing. Uh, these are going to start to accrete here and become um, uh, Africa. I'm not Africa. Um, Alaska and the Northwest Territories. And as you can see. High mountains, warm sea, but no way to get through. And this sea is probably just choked up with sediments, and, and it's probably much warmer than this one over here. So around 275, you're going to start to see something that looks like this in the New England area. The mountains have eroded down to, to more of a rolling highland. Um, now they are actually cutting into their own sediments. Uh, New England is very far away from the ocean, um, near the interior of the Pangaea Subicon, and has become very, very arid. And this is one of the things that really wrecks havoc on life forms at the time, because uh, they've never been in a, you know, in such a dry environment. And the dry environment, you know, has just massive uh, temperature fluctuations. It's not friendly. There's not a lot of food, so things really need to adapt. 
But if you were to go to Maine, I think you'd see something that might look like this. Uh, a very dry, we know that we were in a desert, a very cold desert, um, after the uh, culmination of Pangaea. So you might see something that looks like this. Got layer upon layer of ashes or silts and red beds. This is like uh, sands that were just stained by hematite, uh, stand, sands that don't have hematite. Uh, but these are, in general, they are aquatic uh, marine sediments. This is uh, Iran. Um, these were laid down in the Tethys Ocean um, and then were uplifted as the uh, Tethys Sea uh, crunched. And then over time, uh, uh, the mountains eroded and you're starting to see some of the, actually, this is actually the flank of some of these uh, mountain ranges where you're seeing sediments just sort of like piled out. So some of them are in situ, some of them have been piled out, but in any case, you're just seeing a lot of sediments that are very arid and very dry, probably about a mile high, one to two miles, uh, and they are just inhospitable for the most part. You're like, you really need this to be able to, if you're a creature, you need food, you need to figure out how to get water, which means you probably need any water you get to last you a long time. Uh, you need to deal with heavy-duty temperature fluctuations. Warm-bloodedness seems to be a, a really helpful thing at this point. Um, and you need a way to get around. And you probably need to move in fairly large areas. You know, you need to move quite quite a bit of distances. So the reptile at this point seems to be the, the, the design that works. Ah, the Dimetrodon. <laughs> Then, of course, there's these. So the Dimetrodon is, a lot of people see it as a dinosaur. It is not a dinosaur. They lasted about 20 to 25 million years. They were a very, very successful um, species. They more or less developed out of a common ancestor um, that split uh, in the Carboniferous. And... When I say split, we sort of had a reptilian, like rep, we had a reptile or something that was reptilian-like that evolved uh, out of the amphibians. Um, and then that lineage split. So what I'm saying is that we had a, a common ancestor with the reptile that was a reptile. Uh, an early form of it that came up and then split and one side had uh, had three lobes developed three lobes in the head um, as well as different sets of teeth uh, and also a couple of other sort of qualities that separated them from being a pure reptile we are reptiles it's just that we evolved into a uh, more we evolved into mammals, but you can't get a mammal without going through the reptile stage first. However, um, when the reptiles branch split, one went to form mammals and mammal-like creatures. The other one went to, to form crocodilians, dinosaurs, and birds. So think of it that way. You've got crocodiles, birds, and, 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 and dinosaurs in, in, in one group, um, and then you have all the mammals uh, and mammalian-like reptiles um, up until you actually get a true mammal on the other side. And the difference between the two is the holes in the head um, as well as the, the dentition. Um, there's a few other things that I guess we could... One is also regulating the body temperature. As time went on, we began to really begin to regulate the body temperature. And that is what brings me to this. So, far as we can tell, all reptiles will go out in sun. When they get cold, they go out into the sun, they heat up, and that keeps their metabolism going. They get the, they, they, they use that to basically produce uh, uh, heat inside themselves, which allows chemical reactions, which allows them to become more active and allows them to hunt and, and feed and all that. And that looks great. That works great as long as the air is warm for the majority of the time around you. You can survive. Um, the... And, and what we refer to those, we refer, refer to those as sauropsids. Now, we are synopsids. Sauropsids, dinosaur, synapsids go to humans. And during this split, what happens is the creature has kept sort of the amphibian design by having it low and squatty because it is a fairly uh, good way of locomotion. 
Um, but again, the adaption is in the mouth. The, the mouth now has um, three different types of teeth, I believe, on this particular one. Uh, may have more. There's at least three. You've got canines, you've got incisors, and probably molars. Um, and you also have uh, three. You have, you have an extra set of holes between in the, in, the, in the skull. And what this does is that even though the skull, our skulls are essentially the same, and they have rearranged a, a bit in, in shape and what have you, the partitions and the separations remain similar. Just the actual sizes have changed. And so now I'm going to explain to you why this is truly one of the ways we go into being a mammal. And a lot of scrutiny has come with the, you know, what are the sales for on Dimetrodon? And Dimetrodon, believe it or not, we're one of the, we're, we're one of the most successful species to come out um, at the time. Uh, they, they were found on all continents. They are an index fossil, meaning we can absolutely identify a time period when we find them. They are that popular. They are numerous. Uh, they were both meat-eating and plant-eating, I believe. Uh, I don't know many species that can do that. So these guys really had a good design. But again, I'm going to come back to why this is important. And I'm going to make my attempt at what I think these are for. Now, obviously, they probably form in some sort of display for mating or fighting or intimidation. But let's really think about this for a minute. Here's the sun. We know that at this particular time, the climate was changing radically. It was becoming much cooler. Now, you're a reptile. You need to keep warm. What are you going to do? You need to find a way to absorb the sun. Well, you don't need to, if you're in a fairly warm place, even though it has fluctuations, you don't, and, and by that, that also because even though it's getting cold at night, it may be very warm during the day. Let's face it. Saudi Arabia is brutally hot in the summer and winter. I mean, summer and then summer nights. But in the wintertime, it's hot, but then it's freezing. So you've got massive fluctuations. It's no reason to think that interior Pangaea was any different. So these sails, I feel, if you don't need the heat, it, if the sun at noontime is coming straight down on these, not a lot of surface area to hit, so you really don't need the sail to warm you up. But in morning and at night, this, the sun's lower in the sky, and it hits these sails on the sides and heats them up and that would be a very passive uh, way to absorb the heat that you need because you need heat after the cold night and you want heat to make it through the night and so I think that one of the uses of this particular uh, sail is absorbing heat at different times of the day and not needing it so I think that might have I think that's just an evolutionary uh, design from those two things. Uh, and again, it kept the low, it kept the shape of the amphibian and some of the reptiles, but it's not, it didn't go into the dinosaur-like form where it's all thin and can move rapidly and is skinny and it just doesn't have that early uh, archaeosaur design. It has sort of a squatty, uh, you know, uh, tetrapod, uh, tetra uh, uh, tetrapod um, design with the tail for balance uh, and then strong legs that it can move, although the legs stick out from the side and not under. The difference with the dinosaurs, the legs are actually under it, and that's why it became a much quicker uh, species. These are still sticking out from the sides. But anyway, the Dimetrodon uh, adapted, and it figured out a way to keep heat. It figured out a way to hunt. It figured out a way to, to keep its metabolism warm. And again, this is a very successful species. Here's a Dimetrodon um, in the Permian. Again, you see that the sails and the, the shapes of these creatures are all different. Um, this guy is just kind of hanging out next to the shore. Uh, it looks like you got a little Dimetrodon here, uh, maybe one over here. It could be a mother. Um, looks like it killed something here. I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the Dimetrodon. It's a beautiful animal uh, and in a direct lineage, in direct lineage with human beings and all other mammals. Now, this ends up moving into this. As I said, there's seropods, and then there's, there, 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 there's, yeah, what did I say, sir? Synaps, synapsids and seropsids. So there's seropsids and synapsids. Seropsids become dinosaurs, synapsids become um, mammals. So if you look at this next picture, this is what the seropsids become right here. You can see it's got a crocodilian sort of look to it. It's 
got a crocodilian sort of mouth. Still kind of walks on four legs, but it looks like it's getting more upright. Um, and you can see it's got teeth and a tail. Um, and so this is a carnivorous uh, seropsid, which is, you know, could either go into a croc or could be down to uh, or or not. I don't know exactly what species. This is the sort of the cow uh, of the time. This is sort of the plant eater, grazer of the time, these right here. Um, and then you've got sort of a sort of a squatty little, I'm not really sure what this is right here. Um, I'm not even going to make a guess at it because I'd probably get it wrong. But anyway, it's just another reptile. Uh, but, but, the, but the real thing you want to take a look at here is these guys. These are Gorgonopsids. And if you look at the face, you can, I mean, it is the bear, it is the lion, it is the tiger. It is the killer whale of its time. And as you can see, it's gnawing on something right here. Um, this might have been one of the, I don't know. Um, it made a kill, uh, may have hunted in packs, highly intelligent for its time. Not a mammal, but a mammal-like reptile. And it was on its way. I mean, you look at the, the teeth. Look at the head design. It is not hard to believe that this is far from being what's going to become uh, a tiger or a lion. Look, the, the, the design of the mouth is very similar. So the Gorgonopsids are, are going further down the line and growing in size um, along the mammalian or mammalian-like reptile or the synapsid uh, timeline. And to be honest, had we not got the extinction, I not I mean, these guys were absolutely in control of these guys. These guys uh, were not going to go to battle with these dudes. I just can tell you that right now. I mean, yes, there are some species of sauropsids that got kind of insane and gnarly, but nothing compared to what these things were more intelligent. They've got different sized teeth. They've got all sorts of different of advantages. I, I believe they could uh, help keep their metabolism warm. Uh, they were not warm blooded, but they definitely had uh, a way. Their metabolism was higher for sure, um, which means they needed more food. Um, but in the arms race, these guys are taking off, and these guys are becoming left behind. Um, and if it wasn't for the Permian extinction coming up, I don't really know which way we'd go, because um, the Permian extinction took these guys out, all of them. These are the ones, these actually survived. So, um, I don't know. I mean, if, if had we not had that, these, I'm sure, would have just been that they would have ruled. I think mammals would have taken over much earlier, um, which makes you wonder, you know, what would be we, we be like. But anyway, Gorgonopsids are it. They are the, this is, this is, this ecosystem right here is the apex of, 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 of the time. And this is the first round of evolution that gives us all the creatures we see today occupying very similar niches. You've got your meat eaters here. You've got your grazers here. You've got uh, smaller uh, salamander, uh, just amphibian like. You've got large uh, carnivorous reptiles. Um, you've got uh, grazing reptiles. Um, you know, You've got things here that are occupy very similar niches that that you that you see today. That's amazing because this is the first round of evolution, and it was, I mean, it wasn't peaking, but for our timeline to what we see today prior to the extinction, this this is a peak, and this gets gets, gets absolutely whacked, and and uh, evolution in a sense gets brought back down and has to kind of start over again. However, we already had the basic designs, and the ones that survived really uh, diversify very quickly. But the end Permian is, is every much as diversified in, in, in ecological niches as we see today, and it is amazing that life made it that far um, by about uh, 250 million years ago, only to get the clock reset and have to start over, which gave us the rise of these guys. Had it not happened, I don't think that these guys would have evolved past these guys. I think these guys would have just turned into some just gigantic mammalian-like thing that was probably in the order, same as a tyrannosaur, but they would just be more related to us as opposed to these guys. Pangaea, 260 million years ago. Uh, we already went over, you know, this is Pangaea. We already know all about that. Um, all right, the Permian period. Uh, the Pangaea supercontinent comes together, affecting Earth's climate. 
uh, Pangaea separates the Earth's ocean, just changing oceanic circulation. Uh, the central Pangaean mountains, the Appalachians, reach their zenith in height, approaching and possibly exceeding the Himalayas. The massive mountains begin to erode, uh, very extreme, uh, and, and, uh, due to their locations in the equator. The climate becomes increasingly warmer and drier, with large desert areas and massive seasonal fluctuations, and then global temperatures spike rapidly uh, near the end of the Permian. Life is flourishing. It has evolved to enough occupy all of life's niches, although apex predators were not mammals as they were reptiles, but they were very much mammal-like, and they were not true reptile late they were but again they are on the synapsid uh time uh um lifeline or evolutionary line as opposed to the seropsid which is the reptilian one and that will be it once you see bella the lecture is over and i thank you very much for watching and listening and i'm going to start to crank out the rest of these now that it's getting cold and um our next subject is going to be on the big five mass extinctions and there's the Permian right there. And we're going to go into this. I didn't really go into these ones too much because, well, we don't know a whole lot about them. Not like we do um, between this one, this one, and this one. Um, but we may go back into these at some other time. Anyway, Bella says goodnight and aloha and thank you for watching.